Hello everyone, I am Kurz, this is Low Mana, and following Dantier's look into the lore behind the anniversary skins yesterday, check that out here if you haven't already, today you are joining me as I look into the lore and easter eggs in the brand new arena apps that landed with the event. I tried writing all of this into a single video, I really did, but it would have ended up an epic, so instead I've split them up and will today be turning my attention to the green hills of Mexico. Of the three maps, the one with the most crammed into the small space that each one of them occupies is almost certainly Castillo. Necropolis comes a close second, but with the number of goodies in Castillo, it would be rude to not delve into its secrets first. Before I begin, one of the little oddities with Castillo is that it's the only one of the three new maps to still be called by its parent map name when loading in. Necropolis says Necropolis, Black Forest says Black Forest, but Castillo still says Dorado. Odd, no? As a location, Castillo sits on a hill further out towards the mouth of the bay that Dorado sits on, and at a glance appears to have been designed with defence in mind. Much of the map stands on a fortification built into and on the hillside, with the bay facing walls adorned with ramparts and cannons. The vast majority of these cannons are pointing out to the open water, though there is one that is worryingly pointed almost squarely at Dorado. Probably best not to ask why. While clearly built with defence in mind, a little community has clearly built up in Castillo, with houses and various amenities to be found in the structures atop the walls. One of the first places you'll see is the Calaveras Bar, which is somewhere we've seen before, albeit only in a fleeting glimpse. With a name meaning skulls, it doesn't sound like the friendliest place, but I suspect there are reasons for it that I'll address later. This was the bar that we saw in Reflections, that had McCree slumped over it snoozing the festivities away, while Sombra peered suspiciously into her glass a few seats away. At the time, the bar had no name but there are a number of giveaways here, from the fact McCree appears to have carelessly left his hat behind, I'm guessing he has loads, maybe he reloads hats like Reaper does shotguns, through to the patterned wall hanging opposite. He's not the only non-local to have paid a visit to this particular watering hole however. By the door is a small table, but on it sit some relics from Roadhog and Junkrat, specifically one of Mako's gas canisters and one of Jameson's detonators. Overwatch characters seem to do a real good line in leaving their stuff behind. That aside, this seems to be where they plan their now infamous heist on the Banco Dorado, an act that helped extend their notoriety through a moment in crime. The streets surrounding Calaveras tell you everything you need to know about the small town. It is owned lock, stock and barrel by Los Muertos. Indeed the name of the bar would to me indicate that they had a hand in naming it given their affinity for all things skull based. They seem able to operate with complete impunity and nothing shows this better than two of the central buildings. The first is nominally the Castillo police station, and while there are cells of a sort, I'd be willing to put money on no Los Muertos member having spent a night in there for many a year. Even the words marking the police station for what it is have been daubed over in the usual fluorescent graffiti spray of the criminal gang. That said, there isn't much of Castillo's back streets that isn't now an interesting shade of yellow, green or purple. From Sombra's iconic skull through to words proclaiming this is the land of Los Muertos, it's hard to argue with that sentiment. Other graffiti includes The King is Dead, an obvious reference to Guillermo Portero, the once heralded hero of Mexico, and now seemingly disgraced former head of Lumerico, who fell from power at the culmination of the Sombra ARG. It is his statue in the centre of Castillo that stands proudly, an image of him in his younger days as a war hero of the Omnic Crisis, contrasting his more sedate presidential older self that sits immortalised outside Dorado's town hall. Maybe both these statues will need tearing down soon. The other building I mentioned sits across from the police station, and appears to be acting as a miniature weapon storage facility. If you take a closer look, it becomes apparent that this is the location in which Los Muertos were shipping rifles in piñata crates as seen in Hero. Not only does this further prove how much they own Castillo, but it also brings all of the disparate events pretty close together on the timeline. From Hero, through to Reflections, through to the in-game events and the Festival de Luz, through to the Sombra ARG, Everything is happening relatively close together in the Overwatch universe, at least in Dorado. Newspapers scattered around the map also point to numerous events, both local and global. The local journalists at La Voz de Dorado seem to focus on three overlapping stories, many of which link back to the graffiti I just mentioned. The least interesting is the headline, Investigation into Portero, which merely confirms everything we knew, though whether his temporary resignation becomes a permanent one may be an interesting line to follow. Portera being deposed, however, seems to have indeed rendered us, us all useless to Sombra, much as he said it would at the end of the ARG. One of the other headlines states that the Sombra Collective, that was the one that we were all part of in the months leading up to BlizzCon, has disappeared. 
What hasn't disappeared though is Numerico, and given the size of it and the importance it holds to Mexico as a whole, this can come as no surprise. Even with Portero gone, they keep going, and one of the emails that we all kind of put on the back burner during the ARG seems to be coming to fruition. The email came from Sanjay Korpal, Vishgar agent and handler of Symmetra. In it he referenced the framework for a deal between the two companies, and sought to allay the concerns of Portero regarding the blip on the radar that was the Rio de Janeiro development. That's a quick reference to Lucio there. That embryonic deal now appears to be maturing, with the press now fully aware that the two companies have reached an agreement. I would dearly love to know what they've agreed on, but given their track records, I can't imagine it's great news for Mexico. The final story is the only truly international one, and tells of a massive cyber attack on Volskaya Industries, complete with a photo of Katya Volskaya herself. While the promise of such an attack was one of the final acts of the ARG, nothing ever really came from it, and with the events of infiltration it seemed like a physical attack was the way forward for Talon and Sombra. Perhaps that wasn't the end of things though, perhaps Sombra is actively monitoring the trails of her new friend in Russia, we shall have to wait and see. What Sombra definitely is monitoring however, becomes clear in one of the coolest rooms lore wise in the entire game to date, her mini apartment thing. When this map first leaked out I speculate that this could be a throwback to her youth and that she had long since moved on, but now this very much appears to be an active base of operations, despite her work with Talon. The room itself is quite plain, a simple bed with a lone teddy bear, some simple cooking facilities, some snacks called divas that look suspiciously like but totally aren't Doritos, I don't know what you're talking about, and two of the same poster of the green head character we've seen previously in the Hanamura arcade. This last is a little odd. Two of the same poster indicates a bit of an obsession, but we have no clue who this character may be. It's one I'd appreciate your thoughts on. Near the kitchen area sits a workbench, currently covered in what looks like Sombra's translocated device. Remember, this is technology she's pinched from Winston's work on Tracer's Chronal Accelerator, so who knows how recently she's managed to perfect it to her own ends. It may be that infiltration represented the first time she's used it in anger, and if so, that'd be one hell of a ballsy field test. By far the most important aspect of the room though is her myriad computer systems, from the holographic projection of the infamous web through to a multitude of monitors and the machine that started it all off when she was a little girl, though I hope and suspect it's been replaced a few times since then. Perhaps stemming from her encounter with him at Christmas, one monitor is dedicated to exploring the link between McCree, Overwatch, and strangely, Anna Amari. Given McCree was missing from the web in her origin story, it makes sense for her to feel the need to pin him down, but why Anna? What link is there worth exploring between them? The three sit next to the mysterious eye logo that dominated the heart of her conspiracy web, but this really doesn't help me to answer what she's looking for. Again, I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Beyond that are yet more mysteries, this time in the form of a world map marking three objectives. One is almost certainly Volskaya Industries on the far east side of the image, and that on the west coast of Africa, that's going to be Numbani. We know Talon of active interest in both of these locations, namely Katia Volskaya in the former and the Doomfist Gauntlet in the latter, so these are no great shock. The third objective looks to be somewhere in the eastern half of the USA, potentially around the Indiana Kentucky area. It's really hard to make out due to the scale of the map and the size of the objective marker. For all that we have three characters and two maps from the US, it remains relatively unexplored in the Overwatch lore, so perhaps this hints at a future mission Sombra and Talon will be embarking on in the near future. Finally, let's finish on a high, the conspiracy web. While this bears many similarities to the more fleshed out web in her origin story, this one has important differences. Firstly, it's missing an absolute crapload of stuff, but rather than meaning this is less developed, it could merely be more focused for what she's currently investigating. Of particular interest are the two modified hexagons, I have no clue why they're modified, but they're notably different. And if you transpose the image back, you'll find that they're the icons for Genji and the mysterious Omnic that Kanchi Volskaya was dealing with. Does this perhaps indicate a link between the two? Beyond his encounter with Hanzo and his time with Zenyatta at Christmas, we know little of the movements of the former Blackwatch agent, but is it possible he has some involvement here? If so, what would he be doing? As for Volskaya herself, well there are a bunch more hexagons to the left of her and her company that were never present, or at least never visible before. Unfortunately, they're blank so my speculation is limited, but could these represent new information that Sombra has managed to obtain through her new friendship with Katya? Certainly possible, hopefully time will reveal all. Thanks for watching this tour of the lore behind Castillo. Did you learn anything new? What are your thoughts on the map? Did I miss anything? 
Let me know in the comments below and stay tuned for Necropolis lore coming up in the next few days. As ever, there's a link to our Discord in the description below that you can join. Don't forget to hit that like button if you like this episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the little bell for notifications on our latest content. Until next time, I've been Kurz, thanks for watching.